Burn! Lightning! Shatter! Chain of memory starts with Black Dracula leading Sky Donatello and Wacky to his non-Euclidean holiday home known as Castle Oblivion. The gang enters and immediately tries to attack their gracious host, only to find out that the moment they entered the castle, they forgot every spell they ever knew. Oh no! I can think of more delicate ways to bring the party back to level one, but whatever works, I guess. Regardless, Palpatine tells Sora that to find is to lose, and to lose is to find. Crazy gibberish! He then T-poses through Sora, getting a taste test of his memories before yeeting a trading card at him, telling him that he's about to take you back to the past to play some Disney World's The Suck Ass. Left with numerous options, seriously, just leave. The gang decides to play the Hooded Gentleman's game, wielding the Pokemon card and entering the first floor. Floor one, Traverse Town. Okay, so the worlds work a little differently in Chain of Memories. Instead of exploring multiple worlds via the worst form of travel ever invented, you keep ascending up and up through Castle Oblivion, with every floor being a world from Kingdom Hearts 1. Does this mean that there are no new worlds? No, there's a couple with actual story importance towards the end. Does this mean that every single Disney world is completely fucking pointless since it's just what happened in Kingdom Hearts 1? Yes. Funnily enough, this also means that the only important story beats happen in between floors, so every single Disney floor will be disregarded, shunned, and ignored. Sora enters Travis Town, finding that his cohorts have been reduced to bog form. Oh no. Mr. Black then tells protagonist that if he wants his friends to feel the third dimension again, he has to seek them on the battlefield. He then shoves Sora into a random encounter. <laughs> Okay, I know, I'm talking about the gameplay when the series is supposed to be about poorly explaining the story. Nothing but lies! But I cannot and will not ignore it this time around. Kingdom Hearts 1 played like a typical action RPG with a pretty revolutionary idea in the form of the action menu, allowing you to pick different actions for different situations, much like a traditional JRPG, but on the fly. This also meant that fighting enemies was super seamless because it happened naturally without having to transition into a separate environment. Naturally, you'd stick with these ideas for the next game, right? Wrong. You see, what I'm showing you right now is actually kind of a lie. When I talk about Chain of Memories, I'm actually talking about Re-Chain of Memories, as in the remake of the original game. And the original game looked like this. Whoa, nice graphics! Now, I'm not a software wizard or anything, but I can't imagine porting action RPG combat to a system that runs 3D games at around 8 frames per second is a particularly simple feat. So instead, they make you wait 5 seconds for every single fight to start and gave it card battler mechanics. This means that every single attack is bound to a card. So regardless if you're swinging your keyblade, casting magic, summoning something, walking your dog, pleading innocence, or launching a fucking nuke, you better believe it's gonna be in card form. This also means that every single attack has a number attached to it, from 0 to 9, with high numbers being more useful than low numbers. For example, if you play a Cure card with a 1, you'll start the healing animation, only for the enemy to attack with a 4, stopping your healing and making you feel like an absolute fool. To put it in a simpler perspective, try playing Kingdom Hearts 1, but every 10 seconds, someone gives you an electric shot. Ah, son of a bitch! Ah, ah, yeah. What? No, I don't. That's not you. Ah. I'm sorry, I couldn't avoid the fact that this game plays like absolute ass, but it was going to happen at some point, so at least it's out of the way. Now back to unimportant things. They make it back to Castle Oblivion when Dr. Mysterio asks them if they enjoyed their trip down Asset Reuse Lane, when suddenly another figure appears, this one sporting a face. This hedgehog-headed boy is Axel, a member of the organization, something that isn't super important right now, but will be in the future. Write that down, write that down! Axel tells Sora to rememberize his name and then proceeds to get pummeled by the infant and his holographic companions. He also tells Sora that he's forgotten something, implying that there's a third character in the spooky mansion other than Riku and Mickey that they should be searching for. However, when trying to recall this person, Fred, Barney, and Dino find that they're having trouble just remembering some of their own basic memories. Assuring themselves that it's just their age catching up to them, the trio ascends to the next floor. Floor 2, guess who? Nobody cares about Aladdin. After leaving the desert sands, J, Mike, and Rich continue to discuss the fact that certain patches of their memory are suddenly blank, including the location of Hollow Bastion. Realizing that the cryptic nonsense Dr. Evil said might have some bearing on the situation, Sora determines that Castle Oblivion must be messing with the group's memories. Metal. Here. While all this tomfoolery is happening, we also get shown clips of this mysterious blonde-haired girl doing unbelievably terrible doodles. Floor 3, whale come back. Pinocchio is a little sticky. Do you fucking get it? Wood! Meanwhile, in a different layer of evil, Axel is taking his lunch break with Lark Scene, another member of this devilish organization. Axel finds it strange that the Keyblade would choose a literal teenager as its wielder, and finds it even stranger that Sora managed to maintain his sentience as a heartless. Loxine cackles and snickers because her character can basically be summed up as, what if Regina George was in Kingdom Hearts? Back with the gang, they continue to ponder if they've forgotten anything important, while Sora reassures himself by clutching Kairi's only plot importance in this game. Being a fucking flashback. Floor 4, Olympus Coliseum. Here comes a new challenger! 
Okay, so a certain idiot who will remain unnamed supplied me with an idea that will let me condense this nightmare of a game into one video rather than two. Normally you would just see the game from Sora's perspective, but after you complete it for the first time, you unlock the ability to play as Riku with his own unique story. He has various gameplay differences, but his story effectively runs a little bit behind Sora's. I figured showing his story back to back with Sora's would make for a much more streamlined experience and make this video less of a headache to make. It'll probably be way harder to follow, but you're a quick learner and I believe in you, so everything will be fine. <laughs> Having been trapped in hell for a non-specific amount of time, Riku wakes up in a grey void. A familiar voice tells him he should rest in the warmth of the void womb, lest he fall to the icky darkness again. Riku tells that lousy voice that he's ready to be a big boy and decides to live dangerously and trust in the heart of the cards, stepping into his memory of Hollow Bastion. After confronting his past of being a weenie and running away a lot, Riku encounters Ansem. Despite being splashed by Kingdom Hearts' lamp department, Ansem is still alive, oh no. clinging to the darkness within Riku in hopes that he'll succumb to it once more. Thankfully, Riku has grown a brain cell in between games, causing him to tell Ansem to go groom someone else. Also, his every time Ansem says darkness in a single cutscene. Darkness, 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 darkness. This cutscene was less than two minutes long. How embarrassing for you. A royalty free Mickey tells Riku that only good boys get to ride Splash Mountain, strengthening his resolve. This causes Ansem to get slightly angrier than usual, making him inflict the greatest punishment of all. Tutorials. Dear God. With typos. No. After a meaningless encounter, Ansem helps Riku grow his card collection, along with tempering the Lincoln Park still dwelling within him. This allows Riku to activate D-Mode. This has no importance in the story, I just couldn't let this joke pass by. Fucking D-Mode. <laughs> Also, while all this is happening, we get a closer look at the basement dwellers of Castle Oblivion, namely Lexius, who looks like the brick equivalent of Pinocchio, and Zaxion, the living embodiment of My Chemical Romance. They meet with another member known as Vexen, a scientist. You can tell he's a scientist because he never shuts the fuck up about it. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. They sense that two new s scents have entered the castle and that they should... They should... Okay, we gotta talk about this right now. When I made that joke about bathing in the stinky darkness in the last video, that was only a half joke. For God knows why, they established that darkness apparently has a scent in this game, and it's immediately identifiable as being really fucking weird. Why does this have to be related to scent? Couldn't this have just been some sort of sixth sense? What does darkness actually smell like? All questions that will never be answered, but I feel I had to mention it because it's super strange that the writers decided to make this a thing. Maybe it's a bad translation. I don't know. I'll never forgive the Japanese! Riku encounters the ghost of Christmas capitalism and tells him that he can only send 1% of his power to here because of reasons. Back up we go! The gang escapes the limb pussy while Sora has vague visions of another girl in his memory who may or may not be the girl we've seen during intermissions. <laughs> Lexian finds out that he's actually able to identify Riku via his despicable odor and wonders why he's somehow manifested in their basement. Vexen claims it's obviously due to Sora already being in the castle because friendship is apparently GPS for the soul. And Lexius is just happy to be there. Yay. Floor 5. Wonderland. More like Blunderland. <laughs> Sora tries to remember who this mysterious fourth friend was, but can't and assumes she must have gone to a different school and that you wouldn't know her. Tails and Knuckles continue to banter in front of their spherical television. Spherical! Riku runs into Vexen, who tells him that he stands between the light and darkness in some sort of Oreo-based situation. They slap each other around for a bit before Vexen runs away, stating that he collected all the data he needed. Law 6, Halloween Town. Sora learns terror. And so will you! Max, Charlie, and Dennis encounter the next member of S Club 7 who tells them that the bad guys are holding the mystery girl hostage. Oh no! Maxine physically assaults a teenager because the weak should fear the strong, causing Sora to drop a charm he doesn't even recognize. After finally reaching his brain blast, Sora remembers that the girl's name was Namine. Phenomena. Maxine continues to mash her taunt button until Sora experiences true anger for the first time, causing him to attack the Sigma Stacy. Sora gets the crappy Etsy trinket back, along with Maxine throwing four more Disney Worlds at him because we paid full price for this back in the day, so you can bet your ass there's gonna be 80 friggin' Disney Worlds. Having exhausted herself by fighting an actual child, Loxine returns to Axel where they both encounter Vexen, having just had his fight with Riku. Vexen then says the dumbest line I've heard thus far. I'm a scientist. Experiments are what I do. Yes. Riku encounters a doppelganger of himself, made from the combat data that Rexen got around five minutes ago. After a match of perfectly symmetrical violence, the replica comes out on top due to fully embracing a shadow condom that he uses for his magnum darkness. Sonic chases after the fake hedgehog until he runs into Ansem again, who tells him that the darkness is bussin', for real for real, on god. He also gives Riku more Disney World so that the game can continue to punish me for playing it. Floor 7! 100 acre- wait, what? 100, 100 acre wood? Is that in the script? I'm not, I'm not talking about 100 Acre Wood. You can't make me talk about 100 Acre Wood. Sora encounters who he believes to be Riku when in reality he's talking to the replica. 
For future reference, I'll be calling the replica Repliku from now on, just to make it so I don't have to think of 10,000 different synonyms for replica. Okay? Okay. Repliku scolds Sora for apparently forgetting this blatantly fake person before causing him to fumble with game mechanics for around 30 minutes. Walter, Jesse, and Mike manage to beat the replica, causing Riku to cry and run away for the eighth time. Repliku returns to his non-biological father after having spent his first day at school terrorizing other children. Loxine tells him that the Power Rangers aren't real and proceeds to pummel another child while laughing maniacally. <laughs> what a hero. She then tells him that the pain is only temporary and that the fake memories they're about to feed into his brain will last forever. Oh no! Sora catches up to Repliku, who immediately throws him a pop quiz about Destiny Islands, causing Sora to realize he can't remember the other bozos from his home. Realizing that Riku must have just had his memory scrambled by the Scientologists, he decides to fix his brain by cracking his skull open. After beating Riku for the sixth time, Repliku claims that he's bleeding, making me the victor. Riku then cries and runs away for the ninth time. Zexion talks about how apparently everyone in the organization hates each other, but still continues to work together for some reason. Lexius wonders what the red crayon tastes like. Floor 9, back to the boat. Axel and Noxine continue to make fun of Vexen's embarrassing figurine collection until the hooded figure from the beginning finally reappears. This individual is called Malusa, the final villain and the main antagonist, despite not being present for like 70% of the game. He calls Vexen a chicken for not wanting to go and fistfight a child, causing Vexen to bring out the gun show and leave to fight Sora. Oh shit! Oh. Replica reveals that Namine gave him the same trinket that she supposedly gave to Sora, meaning that she's either very talented or using child labor to fund the organization. Namine then tells Lady Bitchington that messing with Sora's memories will only make his bond with his friends stronger, and that she's a shadow of Kairi. What an odd thing to say. Floor 10, remember Maleficent? I start to see things I recognize. The gang runs into Vexen for the first time, who tells them that if they want their old lovable Riku back, they'll have to beat him in a game of Gwent. After Frasier, Niles, and Eddie physically enrich him, he throws another card at Sora, claiming he retrieved it from the memories locked in his heart. Nothing fucking happens. Floor 11, Twilight Town. The trio enters Twilight Town, a location that is both unfamiliar to them and to the player. Red, Blue, and Green arrive at a spooky old mansion where Sora starts to feel a sense of familiarity with his new environment. Before he can firmly grasp his memories, Vexen reappears where he drops the title because why not before entering another fight. He gets defeated once more and tries to spill the hypothetical beans about Malusha's plans to Sora before a cane yanks him off the stage. Turns out Axel's here because Vexen was about to betray the shit out of the organization, causing Axel to do an epic anime reference, killing Vexen instantly. After exiting Twilight Town, Replica returns, where he literally pulls the mass-produced trinket out of his ass before they fight. Again. Riku then cries and runs away for the tenth time. Having had exactly zero questions answered about Namine, Sora flies into an uncharacteristic rage before storming off, leaving his worried aunt and uncle behind. Back with Namine, we find that Axel's fetish must be betrayal, because after betraying Vexen, he immediately betrays the others by letting Namine go. Riku runs into Lexington Steel, who tells him that he should embrace his inner goth before they compare sword sizes. Lexius shows Riku what it's like to walk on the ceiling, accidentally breaking his edgelord inhibitors, releasing the darkness and causing his own demise. By using the rancid darkness again, Ansem resurfaces, oh no. who immediately tries to grasp Riku inappropriately. Thankfully, our grand overlord is here to tell Ansem that touching little boys is no good, sealing him away once again. Floor 12, Destiny Islands. Sora meets Namine for the first time, who tells him that all of his memories of her are totally bogus. After getting Sora to take a memory test, he eventually recovers his memories of Kairi, revealing the trinket to actually be Kairi's good luck Charm. Back in Castle Oblivion, Repliku returns and demands to fight again because he's basically a masochist at this point. They clash once again until Namine installs Norton on Repliku, causing him to crash and shut down. Lean Mean teleports in to tell Sora that this Riku is actually just a big fat phony, which would have been a big reveal had I not already spoiled it multiple times. Namine T poses on Loxene, establishing herself as the alpha female. This causes Loxene to abuse yet another child before attempting to finish Sora off. Oh no! However, the Disneyland Parade arrives just in time, giving Sora the courage he needs to teach Loxene the ABCs of Castle Oblivion. Always be murdering. Loxene bites the dust, Namine tells the group that she was the one messing with everyone's memories and Replica continues to be shocked and appalled by the state of affairs. The final floor! Axel and Malouche have a minor disagreement about the morals of keeping children as pets until Sora walks in and misunderstands the whole situation. Content with his plan to murder everyone, Sora starts with Axel, seemingly killing him before moving on to Malusha, who unfortunately still has Namine hostage. Oh no! Sora says friendship, causing Repliku to awaken from his robocoma, releasing Namine from Malusha's clutches. They fight until Malouche decides to transcend into his final Pokemon evolution, the Avatar of Death itself. Sora defeats him, causing Malusha to disintegrate into rose petals and a healthy heaping of salt. With all the known villains defeated, Sora returns to Repliku and Namine, the former of which pieces out immediately. Namine tells Thomas, Percy, and James that she can fix their memories, but only if they climb into this comically large egg. In order to rejuvenate their brains, they'll also need to forget everything that happened over the course of the game. This may make it seem like the game is pointless, but surprisingly it's not. Sora enters the pod and starts to recall the faces of all the friends that he once treasured and loved. Also, Kairi is there. Ah, oh, shit, we still gotta finish Riku. 
Riku trundles through his old home before eventually encountering Sora. Sora tells Riku that he can see he's become so numb before keep blowing his load all over him, causing Riku to have a crisis of faith. Riku wants to go back into the light wing, but his memory of some girl tells him that he can become stronger if he uses both light and darkness together. Why didn't I think of that? He strikes back at Sora, revealing that it was just Zexion in cosplay the entire time. And how did he know it was Zexion? You reek of darkness. Of course! Zexion barely survives and returns to Mother Base, but Axel is still alive and led the replica here to finish off Baby's first emo phase once and for all. Ansem causes Riku to assert his dominance on Castle Oblivion before the light of Megacorpo comes in to save him once again, this time actually having a physical form due to having devoured enough children. <laughs> Mulder and Scully enter Twilight Town, where Ansem continues to be an absolute nuisance only for Riku to call him out on his good hygiene. Turns out it's not Ansem, it's Diz, a belt-wearing psychopath intent on guiding Riku. They have a little chat about light, dark, hearts, keyblades, you know the deal, until Riku encounters Repliku in front of the mansion. Repliku has an existential crisis about how he's not the real Buzz Lightyear before fighting Riku once more. The clone loses for the last time, wondering what will happen to his heart when he dies, while Riku consoles him, telling him that it'll go to the same place as his. Repliku dies, leaving on a genuinely melancholic note, although it says a lot about the average quality of characters in the series when the two most interesting Characters are both Riku. I think that you are the most fascinating character within this setup. <laughs> Not me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> 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 Riku arrives at Sora's cryopod, where he meets Namine, who asks him if he wants to take a power nap to quell the naughty boy inside his heart. Riku refuses, instead choosing to face Ansem once and for all in hopes that he might actually stay dead this time. <laughs> The Phantom of the Beltra reappears, giving Riku a black coat, claiming that it wards off all of that purple nastiness and definitely isn't just used to have homogenous character designs. I'm on to you! Riku finds Ansem, who tells him that they aren't so different to you and I, to which Riku replies with Boo! You stink! Ansem releases the Come Guardian! Once more, they fight, leading to Riku defeating Ansem for the final time. Ansem states that as long as there's darkness in Riku's heart, he'll always remain and claims that he'll return because he's already read the script. And then he fucking explodes for some reason. Riku reunites with Mickey, where they re-encounter Diz, who asks Riku what he'll do now that there's no one left to kill. He tells Diz that he's following the road to dawn, which is genuinely a pretty ball of final line. Also, Dog Street is here. Uh...